is to celebrate that we are here, um, I fully agree to you and me. Um, you know, I consciously chose this work in 1987 as the most important work and that anyone can do at this time. Protecting biodiversity, promoting ecological agriculture. And I want to pick up from where Mark attended. You know, the reason I only wear handcrafted clothes is when I was six, everyone was wearing fake synthetic nylon sari, uh, uh, dresses, frocks. And uh, my mother asked, what do you want for your birthday? And of course, there's always peer pressure. And I said, I want a nylon frock. So I'll get it for you if you really want it. But remember, you buy the nylon frock, an industrialist got his next Mercedes. When you buy handcrafted clothing, a woman was able to feed the children. That was my lesson in political economy. <laughs> and that's exactly what Margaret was talking about. Uh, of course, my lessons in agriculture um, began in 1984 with the disaster in Punjab, where the land of the Green Revolution exploded in violence. And that winter, there was the tragedy of Bhopal. And that first bit of the journey was really for finding out the truth. And the truth was not what has been put in the news week of this week. Well, the future of farming, robots working for us. But it goes back, the narrative goes back to the lie that I found in my studies on the Green Revolution. And this man, Norman Borlo, who was given the Nobel Peace Prize. This is what they write. The Green Revolution in India. In the mid 1960s, South Asia was starving. We were starving. 65, we had a drought. In a drought, prices go up. And all that India asked for was a little more wheat shipment. And the US government said, sorry, we won't send you more wheat unless you change your agriculture and introduce the chemicals and the seeds bred for the chemicals. Our Prime Minister of that time, Lalo Bhushastri, refused. He died under very strange circumstances in Tashkent, and the pressure continued. Borlo did not introduce the Green Revolution. The entire military industrial complex did, and Borlo actually was pulled out from the DuPont defense labs to put to adapt plants, to change plants in order to have them uh, deal with higher chemicals with which farmers' varieties reject. Then it goes on to talk about how wheat yields in India and Pakistan doubled. No, yields did not double. Partitioning changed of a wheat plant. There was less in the straw, more in the grain. But at that time, at the same time, all our pulses, all our oil seeds, all our vegetables, all our trees, all our livestock of the farms was removed. Monocultures were spread. And since India became self-sufficient in cereal, but food is not just cereal. Food is the pulses and the oil seeds, and today India is the biggest importer of pulses and all. See, and that new dependence is never in the equation, nor are the costs to our farmers who were rising in protest at that time. <coughs> but it was mutated into a religious issue, and it's happened exactly the same way this year. The GMO cotton in Punjab got wiped out, 80% crop failure because of the emergence of a new pest that has never been in cotton before, the white fly. And uh, farmers were protesting. They were lying on the railway tracks, uh, refusing to allow trains to move. And suddenly, the Holy Book of the Six was found damaged in a village. And the rest of the time it became about religion, no more about farmers, no more about food. It's happened again and again. The story of Syria is the same. The story of Boko Haram is the same. Every crisis created by the industrial agriculture model is presented as something else. But it goes on to talk about Norman Borlaug. Famine was averted. The last famine we had was 1942, when the British were extracting half the production.
fraction of India as taxes and revenue. And that's when women of India, when you all said, Chan they go, Dham they go, now we will give our lives, we won't give our rights, triggered the 1942 Quit India movement. So one of the things I'm truly getting fed up about is repeated lies. But the interesting thing with this news week is GMOs have disappeared. Now, what's in this news week is on BBC, is on CNN. Um, they call it collaboratory. Paid advertisement are now called collaboratory. And it's all about vertical gardening, pink light. The poor plants don't need all the spectrum of light. They need pink light. <laughs> and I keep saying, okay, you created deficiencies in food earlier. What are deficiencies in this? And I think that's a that's some work we should be doing. Um, and it's also incoherent. The whole thing is so incoherent because um, on the one hand they keep saying nature's inefficient, farmers are inefficient, we've got to have mastery. We've got to have everything under control. What frequency of light, which plants. And then they go and say, and we're doing all this for rewilding. It's a new term that's been created by industrial agriculture. So since you're raising eyebrows, they say we protect nature by leaving larger parts of nature aside. And this is the second degree. There wasn't more production of food as food, and there's been more acreage under food commodities with the spread of industrial agriculture. The biggest share of deforestation is coming from the expansion of the industrial agriculture. And yet they keep talking about how we're shrinking the area. Our work in Navdanya has shown, in fact, you use less acreage when you have more biodiversity. Because biodiversity uses the full sunshine and all its photosynthesis capacity in a much better way to produce more nutrition per acre. And the farm we just saw shows it as real life. Most farms of the world look like that. Including the diversity. In India, peasants evolved 200,000 varieties of rice. We are the center of diversity of the Indica rice varieties. And the Green Revolution could only do, deal with one or two. Chemical agriculture must be a monoculture because it's an external input system. And external inputs create uniformity, and they're imperative for uniformity. Just as much as external control in society attempts to create uniformity. And you just have to remember what happened to poor Germany with the rise of Hitler, where the idea of uniformity led to such tremendous tragedies. The sad thing is, most of the companies who were tried at the Nuremberg trials for making the chemicals for killing people are the anti chemical industry. They are today the biotech industry. People have forgotten the link of these corporations with the Nuremberg trials, and we need to reactivate it, and we do have some plans to do this. Um, let me just give you one example of what happens with industrial agriculture and our food. So, the British had sent to India the imperial botanists, imperial economic botanists, because there was no agriculture science in that time, 1905, to improve Indian agriculture. There's always this permanent attempt at improving us and our plants, you know. And they just can't let it be. <laughs> they can't let us self-evolve in a self-organized way in terms of what is the true freedom of evolution cultural as well as biological. Howard came to India, found soils fertile, found no pests in the field, and as he writes in his book, the classic, called the Agricultural Testament, I threw away my spray guns and made the pest and the peasant my professor. That is the book that spread organic farming worldwide. But he was also a wheat expert and he did collections. And his book, Wheats in India, which I've used a lot for our collections, he documented 1,500 varieties and said they were superior to any wheat of England at that time. 
We've saved a lot of these varieties. The first farmers who've saved our old wheat varieties tell me we ate half the amount. Instead of four chapatis, we eat two because there's far more nourishment. And now the tests are showing us 14% protein. Delicious chapatis, even if you don't have a vegetable with it, you can eat it. The Green Revolution breeding has dropped our wheat and other foods, crops, off their nutrition and health. And this is in addition to the fact that most of the food is grown on small farms. 70% of the food we eat is small farms, only 30% comes from industrial farms. And that 30% uses up and destroys 75% of the planet's resources. At the end of the day, food comes from soil, from sea, from sunshine, from water. When you destroy the very capital from which food grows, for you to claim you are feeding the world is so misleading. Because this system can only, if it continues, can only leave a dead planet and very diseased human beings. So what is the theft of nutrition? First, by the destruction of biodiversity. We used to eat 10,000 species of plants. We now grow about, primarily about 12 globally traded commodities, except for the initiatives of movements like Navdanya and Akinoa and farmers like you. Then the varieties that are bred are bred for chemicals, for responding to chemicals. They are nutritionally empty. Then you don't give food to the soil and the soil organisms, which create the nutrients and the trace elements in the soil, which are taken up by the plants, which then we get. There's a recent publication uh, in the British Journal of uh, Nutrition showing that there's 60% more nutrition in organically produced food. And finally, the way food is processed is another robbery and theft of nutrition. And all industrial processing is stealing nutrition from the food. Industrial milling of flour <coughs> robs all the fiber, robs all the germ. Industrial oil processing, the solvent extraction plants, and not only do they add, not only do they rob nutrition, they add toxics. So you get a double burden. You're losing out the benefits that the biodiversity brings us, fertile soils bring us, organic soils bring us, and good, healthy processing brings us. And instead, you're getting a empty, nutritionally empty food with toxic burden. So the two big externalities that just don't get internalized in the food economics and people like your friend who said it's not economic to grow open pollinated. I like the way you call them pollinated seeds, uh, pollinated crops. Um, the two very, very big externalities are the damage to the planet's health and the damage to our health. We've done an assessment for India, it's $1.3 trillion annually of environmental and social damage. Social including the fact that 300,000 of our farmers have been driven to suicide. No organic farmer, no farmer using local seeds has ever committed suicide. Because they don't get into debt. Industrial agriculture is a debt-creating agriculture. It's a debt-creating agriculture for southern countries. I did an assessment for our 91 structural adjustment. More than 35% of the 90 billion of debt India had had been borrowings for the Green Revolution. Totally avoided. And individual farmers, because the costs of production were so high, and, you know, besides the myth that the famine was averted in India or we are saving the land, the other myth is the myth of cheap food. Only industrial farming can produce cheap food. No, industrial produce, farming produces very costly food. Costs of royalties for the seed patterns, costs of the chemicals, costs of uh, all the other aspects that go for the farmer. Why does the food become 
cheap by the time it reaches consumers. First, the $400 billion subsidies in rich countries. Second, the monopolies. If the only car deal is going to buy a grain, they'll buy it cheap. If a few dairy businesses are going to buy our milk, the milk prices will fall so low that you can't recover, and that's what's happening. I call it the polarization of prices. The prices are increasing for the farmer, they're increasing for the consumer, but the cost that the farmer receives is dropping. And that's why the agrarian crisis everywhere, that's why farmers are leaving the land, and that's why the need to bring back biodiversity and justice and fairness into agriculture becomes so important. So we really have today these two food systems, food and agriculture systems. One based on biodiversity of species, of varieties, ecosystems, of cultures, of knowledges, of economies. Because what you were sharing was creating new markets. You weren't taking a dictation from supermarkets. Through your partnerships, your collaborations, you were shaping new markets. And the other world is the industrial monoculture world of uniformity, in species, uniformities of bulldozing of ecosystems. Uh, my heart cries when I see that most farms of the world have identical hybrid corn. Across Europe, if you're not doing biodiversity farming, you're growing hybrid corn for either animal feed or biofuel. And it's the same corn. And I got off a car one day, I said I want to look. Why are the leaves like this? Our corn leaves go down to say thank you to the earth that's giving them fertility. <laughs> and they said, oh, to increase photosynthesis. I said, as if a leaf bending down doesn't have photosynthesis capacity? There's this amazing uh, assumption of nature not knowing how to function as nature. <laughs> and people not knowing how to function as people. And this system, of course, is wiping out the diversity of our food cultures, creating monocultures of what is not food. I do not see McDonald's as food. I do not see Coca-Cola as food. I do not see GMOs as food. I do not see fake high fructose corn syrup as food. These are inedible items that should never have been in our food. In honesty, we should call them adulterous. the brain of the plant. 
And now they want to say, the poor brown doesn't have brains. They want to tell us, we don't have brains. And they want to tell ourselves, they don't know what is real food and fake food, but they do. We might be fooled on the supermarket shelves, but the cells of our body don't get fooled, which is why the disease epidemics of today. Um, so, of course, this monoculture of one economy where there's deep integration. There's disintegration at the ecological level, there's disintegration at the society level, and there's huge integration between the chemical corporations, the seed corporations, the biotech industry, the traders like Cargill, which wrote the agriculture agreement, the Walmarts of the world, I don't know which one, which your chains are, and the processing industry, the food processing industry, the, the junk food industry, that's what I'm And all of this can only happen with one dictatorship. And that's why the issue of biodiversity for me is truly an issue of freedom in our country. Freedom for life on earth because I, I deeply believe that all species, A, have a right to live, two, have intelligence and self-organized capacity, therefore have a right to evolve on their terms, not on Mr. Gates or Mr. Montana's terms. And thirdly, we now know biodiversity gives us more food using less resources, tastier food, better for our health, and is the best, most effective way to conserve the resources of the planet while feeding the whole world. And this idea that we've got to do all that they want to do uh, is necessary to feed the 10 billion. No, we can feed 20 billion. We can feed 20 billion with real food. No, because commodities anyway don't feed us. They are not food. I've reached the stage where I call it anti-food. You know, at least in, in our languages, we have far more diversity of expression. And we have a term which says a bhaksha. This food is not worthy of eating. And we should make a list of the a foods that don't come from real farms and the loving hands of real farmers. Because at the end of the day, this is really about love. As you so repeatedly said, it came so spontaneously in your presentation. It's a competition between carelessness. Careless farmers spraying around up from drones and caring farmers, nourishing all the plants and the people they bring the food to. Careless corporations, then terrorizing every scientist, terrorizing every government, which dares to say this carelessness is causing harm. And again, we are talking about freedom. So, what are the future trends? There will be a little more rubbish like this for a little longer. <laughs> but can you imagine we had, if we had an article on the CSAs? If we had an article on biodiversity, how many consumers would vote for this and how many consumers would vote for that? It's just that, of course, they buy at Newsweek, but we have other magazines. We have other communication systems, which is why this movement has grown so much. There's a competition of these two food systems through even the word CSA. You use the word CSA as community-supported, citizen-supported agriculture that makes your farm viable. There's another CSA that's floating now, especially in the context of climate discussion, climate smart agriculture. <laughs> so I, just like we have fake food and real food, we have fake CSA and real CSA. <laughs> and I would vote for the real CSA. Thank you.